and collecting stars with colors consistent with belonging to the main sequence turnoff, and making a spatial density map where the densities are color coded by the average distances, and we see structure corresponding not just to the Sagittarius stream, but a number of other major stellar structures in the Milky Way galaxy. So this map was made out to about 50 uh, kiloparsecs away from us. We now see this qualitative consistency with our cosmological expectation. That's what we expect for the stellar distribution. We can also make a prediction for where we expect dark matter to be residing, what its spatial distribution is around the Milky Way like galaxy. And in about 1993, Woodrow Kaufman wrote a paper talking about this in the late 90s. Ben Moore et al. and Clement et al. wrote a paper drawing attention to this sort of structure that we expect around the Milky Way mass galaxy, where we, you know, depending on the resolution of your simulation, you expect tens of thousands of southbound clumps of dark matter to be orbiting throughout the halo of the Milky Way mass galaxy. And these are expected to extend out to hundreds of kiloparsecs away from the center of our galaxy. And in 2014, we observed 25 of these to be lit up by dwarf galaxies. More than half of those have been found in the last decade, thanks to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And I'll now over plot uh, the image from the Bullock and Johnson simulation, just to give you a sense. Right? We see this empty space on either side of that image, just because of the way uh, these different folks chose to visualize their simulations. But we see that the number of dark matter subhalos really fills the halo out to hundreds of kiloparsecs away from the center of it, we expect that the stellar structures start to die off about 100 kiloparsecs away from the Milky Way mass galaxy. So I said 25 of these dark matter halos appear to be lit up as dwarf galaxies. The final piece of visual context I want to give you is what do I mean when I say dwarf galaxies? What are the sorts of objects that I like to study in the near field to learn about these questions? And a lot of folks who study dwarf galaxies, especially if they ever use the word redshift in a sentence, are talking about things like the small to large Magellanic cloud, which are one tenth or less the luminosity of the Milky Way galaxy. And um, see, here is a dwarf regular galaxy. But there's a huge dynamic range in galaxies that orbit around the Milky Way. We can step down again. Here's the Leo one dwarf galaxy, which is one three thousand of the Milky Way's luminosity. If we step down again. We'll see Leo two, about one fifteen thousand of the Milky Way's luminosity, and right, we can see. What I verbally introduced at the beginning of the talk here, these objects are near enough that they're resolved in individual stars. Some are bluer, some are redder, some are fainter, some are dimmer, and we can use these properties to map out the full formation histories of these individual objects. And uh, this star here just happens to be between us and Leo, too. We can step down the hierarchy again. Here's Draco. Uh, it was discovered in 1954 in visual searches of photographic plates. And until the advent of the Sol Digital Sky Survey, this was the bottom of the galaxy barrel at about 140,000 of the Milky Way's luminosity. And you have a pretty good projector here. You can fairly easily see the presence of Draco if your eye mentally counts up the number density of stars in the center of this image and compares it to the number density of stars in the outskirts of this image. That visual over-density of stars is what reveals the presence of Draco to us. Fast forward 51 years from the discovery of Draco, the next object to be discovered around the Milky Way is this. Here is a major one dwarf, which is one one millionth of the Milky Way's luminosity. But we can't see it in this image. Um, it's very hard to, to see objects like this in these images. That's why they were so hard to find. They're found by analyzing catalogs of stars according to their colors and apparent brightnesses, looking for slight statistical overdensities of stars, and then complementing those with follow-up studies, both imaging and spectroscopic, to show that there's a set of stars moving together belonging to a coherent stellar population. So these visual things, uh, these visual properties of, of the Milky Way's dwarf galaxy that I summarized here quantitatively, along with the properties of M31 dwarf satellite population. And so in blue here, we have the Milky Way's dwarf galaxies. In red triangles here, we have M31 dwarf galaxies. And one thing we see is that there's about four orders of magnitude in luminosity, and the physical sizes of these objects span about 30 parsecs to 1,000 parsecs. So we call them all dwarf galaxies. We see that around the Milky Way is the only place that we're able to see the very least luminous of these objects. The studies, people sometimes say, oh, it's so hard to see these objects around the Milky Way. Why don't, why don't we just focus on M31? Well, they both teach us a rich, rich amount about these dwarf galaxy populations. To get to the bottom of the galaxy hierarchy, right now we're limited to studies around the Milky Way. And so again, especially for the graduate students in the room, 
So I did my dissertation work on designing an algorithm to implement to find these sorts of things in SDSS. And at the time that I graduated, we didn't know about any galaxy on this figure to the left of this line, about 10 to the 5 solar velocities. That was empty. And the day I did my dissertation, Paul and I said to me, I always thought there would be more. Right? Now, now we know that there are more. So that's the reason this is such, such a big deal to us. Just in the last decade, there's now an entire field of conferences that focus on what these things can teach us about galaxy formation at the bottom of a hierarchy. And a lot of these studies, right, people spend years and years writing dissertations on these relatively more luminous companions of the Milky Way and M31 because they're interesting to study in their own right to learn about their star formation histories. But in the last decade, apparent tensions between expectations of lambda plus, plus full dark matter models and our observations of the universe on subgalactic scale have inspired a lot of this effort and this focus to search for more faint dwarf galaxies and to study their properties in great detail. And I won't go into great detail on each of these apparent tensions, but the series that's come out since the late 90s into the present day is the missing satellites problem, the too big to fail problem, and this uh, issue, this renaissance of the issue of disks of satellites. The missing satellites problem, different people mean different things when they say this, but at the very basic level, you run a simulation with gravity and dark matter. You predict far more gravitationally self-bound dark matter halos than dwarf galaxies that we observe. What's causing the difference between the number of predicted subhalos and the number of dwarf galaxies we see? The too big to fail problem is still a little bit the reverse of that. You can sort of mentally very easily solve that missing satellite problem by saying, well, a lot of the subhalos, the gravitational potential walls are too shallow. You cannot form galaxies within them. Okay, fine. Well, cold dark matter only simulations. If you take a look at the mass densities of the most massive subhalos that are predicted to orbit around the Milky Way, those dark matter densities exceed what we observe in the most massive dwarf galaxies that orbit the Milky Way. And it's really hard to explain that away and say, well, you can't just say, well, the most massive subhalos couldn't have formed galaxies. No, they were too big to fail, which is why uh, Michael and Colkin and the Irvine team pointed the same. Why is there this difference between observations and predictions of cold dark matter? Something that was originally noted by Lyndon Bell in the late 70s and early 80s was that the dwarf galaxies orbiting around the Milky Way seem to not be randomly distributed, but instead they seem to rotate. Many of them seem to rotate around the Milky Way in a coherent plane, the system of satellites. Folks have more recently um, asserted that as we discover more satellites around the Milky Way, they too seem to be affiliated with this uh, great plane. Uh, Rodrigo Abada and collaborators have recently asserted they see something similar around M31 and perhaps even around other galaxies. And for a while, uh, Pablo, Pablo Krupa and Marcel Kowalowski and others have said, and this is inconsistent with expectations from the, for uh, cold dark matter cosmology. This is very controversial, both uh, how to interpret the observations and how to interpret the simulations. It's a very interesting area that has received a lot of attention over the last year and even just this past week on the archive. So when I look back and I think, what has come of all of this? People say, what are we really learning about dark matter? These works don't teach us about dark matter. What have you done for me lately? I haven't been finding anything worse. These series of three tensions have really been an extraordinary triumph of our field. A decade ago, we didn't know any of these forces existed. We now know that galaxies exist with hundreds of solar luminosities. And these tensions have pointed our attention to the galaxy formation physics that we don't understand. Right? If you don't include galaxy formation physics in your simulations of the dark matter and gravity, it's understandably going to be uh, differences between what you predict and what you observe, at least in some missions. So you know, functionally speaking, most of what we've learned over the last decade has been about galaxy formation. I personally do think we've learned some qualitative things about dark matter, namely that the observations of the universe are at least qualitatively consistent with our expectations, Many people would violently disagree with that statement. I think once on an end of conference panel, some of you have walked out of the room um, when I said such a thing, but it makes for exciting conversations, right? Um, and so in the rest of my talk, the point that I'll be making and some of the things that we've learned and some of the things that we don't yet know will be most applicable to the mystic satellites and the disk of satellites problem. I'm not going to uh, touch the too big to fail issue anymore. Uh, I think it's, it's a, uh, there's a lot of interesting computational work going on in that part. Okay, so, so the first of three big observational conclusions that I'll end this first section with, uh, talking about all that uh, folks have learned over the last decade, we've learned that not only 
Your galaxies exist, which has hundreds of thousands or thousands of solar luminosities, right? Less luminous than individual stars or I see in the night sky. Higher luminosity for some of these things. They also form their stars very inefficiently. They have quite high mass to light ratios. And this is just within their half light radii. Right? This isn't even going all the way out toward the edge of their dark matter distribution. That's telling us something about what's controlling galaxy formation at the bottom of the hierarchy. A second thing that's been learned, this is a really nice body of work by Tom Brown, who's used Solar Space Telescope to get observations of the color magnitude diagrams of some of these different objects. Dan Weiss and Skillman and others have also done very excellent work on this front. And something that's been shown just within the last year or two is that a lot of these ultra faint dwarf galaxies, their star formation appears to be purely ancient. It's consistent with having formed all of their stars more than 12 million years ago. Okay, good. So finally, maybe we're getting a little bit close to what, what physics might be specifically. I think uh, in this round all paper, they suggested, well, this could be caused by reionization. The least luminous dark galaxies are forming in relatively shallow gravitational potential wells. Reionization of the universe could prohibit um, additional gas from accreting onto the uh, galaxy, or could even boil out some remaining neutral gas in those dark matter halos. On the other hand, some folks are saying, well, couldn't these just be the, the dwarf galaxies that fell into the Milky Way's potential well earliest on? How can we really distinguish between these two scenarios? And I'll mention something related to this later. This is an interesting hint of, uh, of origin of these objects. The third and final highlight I'll show is work that a number of people worked on, especially Evan Kirby and collaborators, have made great strides into showing that over a very large range in stellar mass, going all the way up here to regular galaxies, catalogs like the Solar Digital Sky Survey, ultra faint dwarf galaxies are the least chemically enriched galaxies in the universe, with mean iron abundances of less than 1 100th solar. You cannot take a more luminous dwarf galaxy, rip stars off of it, and turn it into these objects that we've been finding. Okay, so we haven't known about, we've only known about these objects for the last 10 years. They've got extremely low luminosities. They've got extremely high mass to light ratios. And somehow they formed like that in their own right. And these may be the most numerous type of galaxy in the universe, and giving us a glimpse of where the galaxy formation hierarchy started at high redshift. So I think I summarized this first bullet point already. What do we know in 2014? What are the triumphs? We have revealed this rich and visible ecosystem in the Milky Way's halo, and showed that these could be structures that are absolutely common throughout the universe, and we're starting to just get to the real meat of what we might be able to learn about galaxy formation uh, through the three examples that I gave you, and what next steps we might be able to take to connect those to galaxy formation. So what is missing from this picture? What's preventing us from going on and saying, and it is supernova feedback and star organization that are causing features of dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. Observational bias is one of the things that plays into our limited picture. So here's a figure showing the luminosity of Milky Way's dwarfs uh, and the distances they are away from us. And we don't actually know the luminosity distribution of these objects. We haven't been able to empirically measure the luminosity function, Honestly, much deeper than we knew before in the end of the Central Sky Survey. And we don't know about their regular distribution. We don't know their number density as a function of distance away from us. And so if we just take a peek at this without thinking about observational bias, right? We see this relationship between luminosity and distance. You know, are these things extremely low luminosity because they have been subject to getting bashed around by the Milky Way because they fell in very early? Or we only seeing those very nearby the Milky Way because the main sequence turnoff stars are only resolved up to about 50 kiloparsecs in SDSS, so they've been undetectable. Why do we care about this? We care about this because I want to know, so one of these is this really pretty one, the segue one, can segue ones form out there on their own? Or did a segue one only get like that because of what the Milky Way has done to it? It really defined the model of the galaxy hierarchy and what limits galaxy formation at a fundamental level. We cannot answer that until we remove this observational bias. We cannot answer what is the luminosity function of galaxies down to the bottom of the hierarchy until we remove that bias. And the only way to remove that bias is to get wide field survey data to much deeper limits than possible than provided by SDSS. That's the only way to get over these community questions. 
And you know, again, we can people are doing an amazing job around F31, but to get down to those sort of limits around F31, maybe maybe dumping first. Yes. What else do we know? Well, we don't know the latitude distribution of dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way, and that's for a couple of different reasons. And this, I, I think a lot about this latitude distribution of dwarfs, because I think a lot about what to say when folks are telling me all the galaxies are in a plane that's perpendicular to the galactic plane. So we see all of these dwarfs that orbiting this. We don't actually know that much about what's going on within 20 degrees of the Milky Way system, even 30 degrees, right? 50% of our area volume is within 30 degrees of the plane. And one reason is that the Sun Digital Sky Survey, which has led to the name of the discovery of these objects, avoided the plane for uh, you know, potential. There's a Segway 1 imaging that did get close to the plane. But if we take a look here at the cumulative attraction at imaging area as a function of its elastic latitude, the vast majority of it's more than 30 degrees away from the plane, which is good, and they want us to do the science. Now, Pan Stars 1 3 Pi Survey provides a possible opportunity for us to get a better picture of what the Milky Way structure looks like closer to the disk of the galaxy, which will help us break some of these uncertainties. And a quite large portion of pan stars is within 30 degrees of the plane, about 40% of it. About 50% of the pan stars area overlaps with where the Sun Digital Sky Survey already looked. And most of the new area is relatively close to the plane. So, Although this provides a really exciting opportunity to learn more about our galaxy structure close to the plane, one has to be a little bit careful. If you follow the Twitter sphere or the different conferences, you may have heard talking about the fact that there haven't been any new dwarf galaxies found in pan stars on 3 pi. Oh my gosh, what is this telling us? We have this highly anisotropic distribution of dwarf galaxies. Maybe we do. Maybe it's showing us something very profound about how this, how this set of dwarf galaxies was, was brought into the Milky Way. We should proceed with great caution. So Shane Walsh, a central thing that he did for his dissertation work, was simulate huge numbers of phase four galaxies and embed them in SESS data, and quantify their detectability as a function of their luminosity and their size and their distance, and also as a function of their galactic position. And at this time, with SESS data really sick, most of most of the volume was about 30 degrees away from the plane. So we didn't have a lot of the effect of latitude, but but he did his toes in the water. And so what this figure shows us is the detectability of a dwarf galaxy with an absolute magnitude of about minus four, a few thousand solar luminosities, as a function of distance away from us, and as a function of the scale size of the object in units of log parsecs. Right? Light is more detectable, it's 100% detectable, black is 0% detectable. And if we just look at the three solid lines for how the maximum detection distance changes for three different galactic latitudes, Depending on the scale size, we see between a galactic latitude of about 70 and 15, it's almost a factor of two in terms of how far away an object can be detected. It's about a 50% difference between a galactic latitude of 30 and 15. And given that Sergei Kokosov and his dissertation work showed that many of the Milky Way's dwarfs were found relatively close to the limit of detectability, we really lucked out. We could be missing things easily at low galactic latitude. And so, although I'm really excited about what Pansar is has to teach us, we need detection limits in order to really interpret uh, interpret what they're finding. Um, I, I very briefly got a little bit into the Twitter and tweeted to, to Nick Martin that I was really I've got a bottle of wine that detection limits, uh, we need to calculate detection limits by I forget what it was, a year from now or something like that. You know, win either way, I'm gonna get wine of this super awesome detection limits paper that we can read and, and interpret what the three-dimensional distribution of Milky Way galaxies are. And some good conversations about this in Boston this summer. It's cheaper. What? It's a lot cheaper than we know about. It's not trivial to do this, right? But there's so many, it's just all this low hanging fruit of discovery. It's really hard to slow down and calculate those detection limits. It's so much more fun, right, to write those discovery papers. And the group has just been doing an amazing job finding exciting things in Kansas um, and in other surveys. At the end of the day, you know, PanStar's uh, 3 pi is great. Deeper, low latitude imaging is needed. Time domain imaging will also get us structure close to the plane. You can see where this is, where this is all headed. So let's say we get that deeper, low latitude imaging over wide fields. What do we expect to find? So my postdoc, John Hargis, his first project after coming to Haverford was to take a new stab at predictions for what the dark energy survey analysis T might find in terms of the Milky Way's world galaxy population. 
And his starting at Harvard was contemporaneous with Shea Harris and Kimmel at Irvine, making public this new suite of 12 dark matter simulations of Elvis, simulations of Care, Milky Way, and M31 systems, which uh, provided a great new opportunity to refresh the predictions made about six years ago by Sergei Kokosov and Eric Collins. In separate books. And the way that we approach these predictions, we don't put a semi analytic model on dark matter simulations. We don't do any abundance matching. We, we don't really, uh, we don't do too much of anything. We start with the only thing that we know for certain. And the thing that we know for certain is. What four galaxies exist around the Milky Way that we've already confirmed? What we know for certain is how big the survey area has been for SDSS, as well as these discoveries. And what we know for certain are the quantitative detection limits produced by chain wall to the focus on. Now, since we don't actually empirically know either the luminosity function or the spatial distribution, we have to assume one of those things to a form of prediction. And so the thing we use the Elvis simulations for is to find an expected, is to uh, make a prediction for the expected spatial distribution of more galaxies around the Milky Way mass galaxy. And then we assume, and this assumption, people almost never make this explicit, right, in any prediction of anything ever. We assume that the unknown things look exactly like the known things. Because if the unknown things don't look like the known things, there's, there's no way that we can back that up, right? If there's this population of stealth galaxies of extraordinarily low surface brightness, there could be lots of them there, but, but we can't make any assertion about that one way or the other. And we can do this to get an updated, estimated number of the Milky Way world galaxies. The way that we obtain a prediction for the spatial distribution of uh, dwarfs around the Milky Way is to implement three toy models onto the subhalos around the Milky Way mass galaxy in the Elvis suite of simulations. And our three toy models are inspired by you know, different, uh, different physics that folks have suggested may be something that's affecting the observed properties of the Milky Way small galaxies. So one of these toy models is that only the subhalos that were the most massive in the past, that had the deepest potential wells at some point in the past, go to dwarf galaxies. Right? So once a subhalo goes into the Milky Way's potential well, it gets stripped and it moves on its mass. But you can trace the subhalos all the way back to their origin and figure out which set of them had the deepest potential well. Another hypothesis, uh, Bogle and Riccati are one team that have suggested this, at least to explain the ultimate dwarfs, not to explain the classical dwarfs, is that the ultimate dwarf galaxies are the things that form in relatively lower mass dark matter halos that collapse before reionization. So objects that have enough gas to form stars before a redshift of 8, 10, whatever, then reionization turned on, and then the, uh, the galaxies were no longer able to form additional stars. And this is inspired not just by the Bogle and Riccati assertion, but by the observations of the star formation histories. And the third toy model, also inspired by the observations of the star formation histories, is that the ultra faint dwarf galaxies systematically inhabit the subhalos that fell into the Milky Way's potential well the very earliest. And maybe that's what's talking about star formation histories. And even though when we do uh, these predictions, we want to follow where the surveys are, we lay these down, we actually look at uh, what the distribution is of subhalos within our microcosmic survey area. We can visualize the average rate of distribution across our surveys. And we see that the average number of subhalos as a function of distance appears to be pretty similar between two of the models, the subhalos most massive of the past and that form before ionization. But even unsurprisingly, the subhalos that fell in the earliest do have a more centrally concentrated distribution. And so one thing uh, that we took away from doing this is the a simple but obvious conclusion that maybe once we can just break down this star barrier of knowing what the radial distribution of dwarf galaxies is, that by itself may actually have some discriminating power when thinking about which, which of the physics affecting the star formation histories of the alternate dwarfs. So we apply these toy models and assert our, our distributions um, to make a prediction separately for the number of dwarf galaxies with more than a thousand solar luminosities of stars, and then separately for those really, really hardy segue one light objects with fewer than a thousand solar luminosities of stars. And the reason that we separate these two is because 
For things like Segway 1, it's so low luminosity that actually the maximum distance out to which Segway 1 can be detected in the SDSS, when you look at some of the ELBA simulations, there aren't even any sun halos resolved at that person. And so there's very large uncertainties, um, systematic uncertainties in those predictions. And so we wanted to at least make one set that we felt very robust about and we didn't have to give some caveats to. And so for the number of four galaxies to be found within 300 kiloparsecs only, an LSST, or DES, looks a little something like this, where we expect 3 to 13 in DES, and 18 to 53 in LSST, where we marginalize over all of these different models and all of our different um, mock surveys that we put down all of the different Elvis simulations, each of which have somewhat different um, merging histories. And a couple of things are obvious when we consider how many works would be detectable, depending on the point source limit to which we want to mine the resulting survey catalog. Okay, so first I'll say what we see, and then I'll say why we visualize the results of this. Because more galaxies with more than 1,000 fold luminosities can be identified as over densities of red giant stars. Okay, red giant stars are resolved out to the zero radius of the Milky Way, even just down to our magnitude of about 23 and a half. And at first, we were surprised by this, but it's actually a really obvious conclusion. It's like, oh, actually, we, we don't have to be that smart. We don't have to go that deep or do that well. In single epic LSST data, we should find every single one of those thousand solar luminosity and brighter dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way, which is pretty awesome. And the reason we chose to break out like this isn't because we don't trust that DDS and LSST are going to have point source detection limits as we've done them. It's because as you go fainter and fainter, unresolved galaxies start to look a lot like stars. And it can be very difficult to tease out low surface densities of stars in your point source catalog. I don't need to worry about that for this particular application. There's plenty of others that we may need to, but we'll need to, but not for this one. The number uh, we predict of Segway one light objects is much larger, three to seven times larger. And so even though DES Heck, they might only find a couple of regular open ultra things in there, which you know, could be surprising, could be disappointing for some. I think about what we find, I'll be excited to just know what the answer is. But if DDS doesn't find a huge number of segway one light objects, we're going to learn something very real about what subhalos that could be populating or whether or not there is some tension, whether our understanding of how galaxies could be forming inside those halos in a cold dark matter context. But it's going to take LSST to really get the statistics for these other galaxies that are, um, have, because they have enough stars to actually study, will bear uh, more broad relevance for understanding galaxy formation. And so I've literally said we're going to find all these, and it's going to be so easy. Um, but sweeping the point that I just made part of this under the rug. But of course, you know, LSST is also going to be looking, a lot of it's going to be within 30 degrees of the Milky Way's plane. So we're pretty close to the Milky Way's plane. How are we going to find those photographic latitudes? Can we just apply these same old techniques? You know, there's going to be a lot of foreground Milky Way stars in there. That's going to be adding noise to our signal of resolved stars from our galaxy. So a stellar tracer that uh, Ronnie Cesar and Judy Cohen wrote a paper about recently in, in a, a part of the complementary, what I'll show you now, that people have started to consider to trace both bound and unbound structure, not just around the Milky Way, but throughout the local group are our Lyra stars. And I worked on this project for a bit over a year with Mariah Baker, who just graduated from Howard College, and this was a senior thesis project. This figure here summarizes what we know empirically about the number of dwarf galaxies observed, about the number of R Lyra observed in the Milky Way's dwarf galaxies. So you've got a log of the number of R Lyra stars, zero, of course, means one star, a lot of galaxies with one R Lyra, as a function of their luminosity. And overplotted our lines of constant specific frequency in some uh, to quantification that was uh, defined in Matthew and Gilmore in 2005. I think this specific frequency is just normalized to be the number of our Lyra stars expected in a globular cluster of mass of magnitude minus seven and a half. But you see that there's this large range in the number of our Lyra seen in more galaxies. And something that has just really shocked me, quite frankly, is the fact that. Take a look at this difference in specific frequency, the factor of 20. For the specific frequency of our Lyra stars observed in some of the classical dwarfs, compared to the specific frequency necessary to get any RR Lyra star 
and the least of them is to our galaxy. I was shocked that it was not our latter star in any of the years. But I took undergraduates to the 50.9 meter for a few years to try to look for our latter and a couple of these close things, thinking, here's a cool project, we'll get some data, we'll learn how to do variable star science, maybe if we're lucky, we'll find something. And what do you know? Aaron Batcher, who's now Wisconsin, found an R latter star in Segue 2. Uh, other folks found an R latter star in Segue 3. Also in Moody's 2, one was just published as an appendix to the Rodney Sayslar paper. All of these things have gone our lyra. And even if we're looking at the relatively more luminous world galaxies, they still have a specific frequency nearly <coughs> factor or higher for those in the class before. So we can simulate what these objects may look like just based on our lyra stars alone. Right? The LSST is going to give us these stars. Might we be able to use those stars to map structures and define objects like these? So Mariah assumed a couple of different specific frequencies, and then you know, assumed circularly symmetric dwarf galaxies, grew the number of our LIRE Poisson distribution, multiplied all these up, and applied a crude detection algorithm to see which things could be revealed. And in parallel with that simulation work, she dug into both the observed and predicted distribution of our LIRE stars to get a sense of what the contamination might be, just from the field of data. Can we really uniquely pluck out dwarf galaxies based on our LIRE alone? This image here shows the spatial distribution of our LIRE observed in the CRTS Mount Lemon survey, which gives us our LIRE out to about 120 more parsecs. And the only qualitative point I want to make here, right, some of this is just not observed area, but if you go farther and farther away, like not about 50 kiloparsecs, there are many areas with fewer LIRE stars, we see some massive stellar structures, Unfortunately, there isn't really any major survey that empirically measures what the structure of the Milky Way's halo looks like beyond 100 kiloparsecs in a way that's very complete, but we can see that it's petering out very quickly, not just from studies of this type of star, but also things that Alan, Alice Eason and others have done with blue horizontal branch stars. And if we think about this, okay, well, there's a whole lot of Milky Way R Larry between 25, or then 25, 50, maybe even have 100 kiloparsecs. So when I find dwarf galaxies, when I find them by their R stars, I think about where I expect them to be, and I look at the spatial distribution of subhalos in something like Elvis, and the vast majority of subhalos, 60% of the subhalos, even in the early Hippo model, are expected to be more distant than 100 kiloparsecs. There's a lot of dwarf galaxy parameters based on there that shouldn't be terribly contaminated. And even though our empirical picture is very incomplete, the theoretical picture mirrors this assertion. Right, so there are simulations like those of uh, Bullock and Johnson. Uh, here's a visualization I made uh, taking from this recent Loewing et al. paper done with Wendy Wang and Carlos Frank and others, where they painted stars using semi-hendrotic model applied to the Aquarius simulations. Oh, it's so nice. There's a SQL interface that's going to be connected to the Millennium Simulation Database. And you can go in there and select simulation stars as a function of the surface temperature, surface gravity, and all these different things. And when we look at this predicted spatial distribution of our library stars, there really aren't very many beyond 100 kiloparsecs. So if Mariah applies just a very simple friendly friends algorithm to her simulated dwarf galaxies, which is imagining around there in 100 kiloparsecs, she can see how detectable they are as a function of their size, the luminosity, the minimum number of our library required for detection, the specific frequency of our library stars, the linking length of your friends and friends algorithm to get a sense of what may be low hanging fruit or not. And the end of the story is the end of the beginning of the story is just that even if you're pretty conservative at wanting to eliminate possible contamination, it looks like the sorts of dwarf galaxies that we can observe now at high galactic latitude should be easy to identify by our library alone, close to the plane, the error of LSST, well out to 300 plus kiloparsecs, which is really exciting in itself. And again, once we got to the conclusion, it was sort of an obvious point, but I think it takes uh, sometimes really pushing the numbers through uh, for it to really hit home, which it finally did for us. Um, and so for me, you know, one of the things that I've started to think about uh, as science collaboration chair of the Milky Way, Milky Way stars of the Hawaiian collaboration of LSST is you know, that part of uh, the Milky Way that's relatively closer to the plane, what will the cadence be like in that extension of the universal cadence, the universal survey, and how can we be sure that we're getting enough hits to, to identify our lottery that we'll be able to access. 
And so the last part of the adventure that I want to talk about before wrapping up, talked about how we know our library stars can map us out to the edge of the Milky Way's halo in the era of you know, LSST. What about now? Can we map out to the edge of the Milky Way's halo and beyond now? And we can, using SDSS plus uh, near infrared, you can survey data, and using end times and stellar tracing. So, in the Solar Digital Sky Survey, only, only a few fraction, only a small fraction of stars in that catalog are visible beyond 100 kiloparsecs away from us. Right? You can see blue horizontal bridge of stars out pretty far. Garden variety red giant stars, you can't really distinguish them from the sea, um, and dwarf stars are very close to us. So it's hard to get a high fidelity map all the way out to the bigger rays of the Milky Way. And that picture is limiting us because the very most distant outskirts of the stellar halo of the Milky Way are the ones that are sensitive to merging dwarf galaxies, the galaxies that have um, come in on the most plunging orbits. Right? So this is a relatively unique way that we can map out the formation history of the Milky Way galaxies to see what the full orbital distribution is of the Milky Way's progenitors that have emerged in the last five million years. And we can only do that if we observe all the way out to the Milky Way's radio radius. And also, you know, who knows? Like, I buy it, this is my older bias perspective. <laughs> I'm assuming that everything we find out there is getting stripped off of uh, merging galaxies. This may not be the case. We may find some surprises, like Warren Brown was surprised when um, he discovered the hyper velocity star population around the Milky Way. And even the most red giants are hard to disentangle from M dwarfs, or sorry, most red giants. M giants can be distinguished from foreground M dwarfs by combining optical and near infrared observations. And folks have done this a lot using um, IRC uh, two maps, uh, two maps alone, and also two maps plus SDSS. Folks like Steve Majewski have really mapped out the Sagittarius stream and MDI with this technique. Now with the UKIDS wide uh, large area survey combined with SDSS, we can do this all the way out to the mirror radius and beyond. And this is a project that uh, was led by John Bochansky as a postdoc at Haverford. And he was a great man for it given his extensive experience mapping the galaxies and dwarfs. And so I already said this works, right? A key difference is how, how can giants be uh, distinguished from the dwarfs? They look the same. This one's an dwarf. And then you pick that up, this one's already bigger. Um, and it's been known for quite some time. The, I think it's Bessel and Brett, maybe in the late 60s, wrote a paper talking about how J, H, and K space uh, M giants separate out. So this figure here shows. UKIDS data from the UKIDS point source catalog and JH and JK. And the overplotted blue points are what you get if you, uh, you know, can evolve UKIDS uh, filter response curves or pickle spectra of uh, galaxies of solar metallicity and of different luminosity classes. And this box here is just a slightly shifted box that has been used in the two mass studies to select out M giants. Here we see is a, a massive M dwarf locus. Um, one lesson I learned, you know, I've done SDSS and involved with survey science for a long time, and I thought I knew what I was doing when I, when I jumped into this. I learned a really, a really important lesson about visually vetting interesting things you find in surveys when first doing this, uh, before John came actually. So I did this, I applied, applied the cuts, I looked at the spatial distribution of N giants, I did a really strict signal to noise cut in the UKIT data, I made the most stringent point source selection limits in the SQL query. Of data, and we found these apparent spatial overdensities of M giants just beyond the river radius of the Milky Way of the angular size you'd expect of a very low surface brightness galaxy that they have to detect. Really excited about this. I'm just telling people, oh man, what do you think? And um, people are excited, but all of us are like, oh, it's just, it seems too good to be true. This one's going to be right. And I, I banged my head on it for a while, and it took me long enough to shift to figure out that all of those problems were going to find the individual one gets you. And I finally reached out to Steve Warren and he said, oh man, there's something we have to figure out how to quantify and point source wise. And in a small fraction of the fields in the J band, for whatever reason, whenever it gets interlaid, there's a, there's a bad pixel left over. And so the J band, the J band measure of luminosity was a fair magnitude was off, and it led to this spurious nudging of things into the M giant spots. And I, I felt silly that it took me so long to realize that, but it was a real word for caution if you're looking for a rare object. <laughs> You can also find very much in the data. 
Uh, one of the many things that Lucanti brought to the project was his familiarity with some of the uh, SDSS UPS works, looking at the color distribution of AGM. So M dwarfs are still a contaminant for us in this candidate sample of M dyes. AGM are another contaminant for us. And inspired by a pathological study in 2011, he used G minus I, I minus K to separate out a lot of the um, likely AGM contaminants in this space. So something that I haven't done yet, but, but that I was thinking about uh, this past weekend, actually, you know, you, um, somebody first would be day and age, this is going to be day and age, to take a look back into that past study and see if we can use J or H instead of K, and still get a good discrimination between AG and contaminants with an eye ahead on combining W first through VISTA with optical data to separate these things out. <laughs> Another nice thing about M-dyes is not that just they're incredibly luminous, you can see them very far away, it's that you know, if we're willing to assume an iron abundance, we can get a decent idea of how far away they are using photometric parallax. And so these histograms are histograms of what the distances of our infinite candidates would be, depending on what their assumed FE or H distribution is. The most conservative assumption is that they're roughly solar metal density. And we see that the distribution peaks at around 200 kiloparsecs, getting increasingly far as you go to lower metal density. And you only get M giants in uh, populations of about, you know, at the very most level four minus one, or like about minus half at the age. So John wrote a paper about this about a year ago, presenting our sample of about 400 M giant candidates that this was in, and he's used a combination of, let's see, we've got uh, IRTF and a fair bit of MMT red channel time in order to get spectroscopic confirmation of these candidates, right, because there is still contamination. And we've only been able to obtain spectroscopic observations of a small handful of these things. And the result so far is that, you know, of course we're looking at uh, some of the most brightest ones first. We can use IRT to look at the very brightest candidates. And those are largely uh, quite close to giants. And that Sagittarius Street, man, like it was it was great for a long time. We saw the Sagittarius Street, it was an awesome example of shifting more galaxies everywhere. Everywhere. I saw this really below crowd ask me this summer. I was like, oh, look at every time we're looking at these envoys here, look at this there. He's just like, yeah, that's a Sagittarius tree. Um, but with MMT Red Channel, we were able to confirm that two of these objects were M giants um, based on the uh, sodium absorption feature, and our best inference based on uh, averaging over a range of different photometric parallax uh, expectations. And that these are between 200 and 300 kiloparsecs away from the galaxy, which is 50% further than any star ever confirmed to belong to the Milky Way. And so first, this is just super cool, right? They're 50% farther than any star previously seen. We've got hundreds of more candidates to follow up. Maybe none of them are going to be m dyes Maybe we got lucky and picked the ones that are in the juiciest regions of color, 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 color space. Maybe there's a huge ecosystem of these m giants that are about hundreds of kiloparsecs away. And there's a lot of work to be done over the next few years with an increasing number of collaborators who are to use LBT and other resources to try to see what's going on out there. Right? Not just is it super cool that we can see these things that are relatively farther away, they're, they're giving us a hint. Right? Once we actually have a more comprehensive sense of how many of these candidates are actually in time and where they are and how quickly they're moving, we can start to answer things like how do they get there? Right? Were these, as expected, tidally stripped? Of some more galaxy accretion event that was relatively more massive, be relatively more massive to get what M9 minus Sagittarius. Could they have been ejected from our own galaxy? Could they belong to a dwarf galaxy that is has a relatively high luminosity, high enough luminosity to have M giants, but it's very, very diffuse, super crazy low surface brightness that we haven't been able to observe before? As I said, there's hundreds more of these that remain to be followed up, and things like DES and VISTA. And LSST plus W first provide really exciting opportunities to follow these up more. And even, you know, W first would be a limited area. Even just LSST can do a pretty good job of selecting some of the you know, juiciest candidates. Uh, John used uh, optical colors to help prioritize our spectroscopic follow up of these, right? And they, unsurprisingly, are having a, a pretty tight region of optical and color 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 space, which is awesome. And I almost understand it here. You know, LSST will reveal M giants for like parsec distances. We're talking like Five to ten angle parsec that we can use these types of resolved stars from that structure in the universe. And this precursor work helping us be a little bit more savvy about how we're going to select candidates or end stars is really going to inform this whole thing. Right, thank you very much.
that's a <coughs> great talk. Uh, I was interested in uh, your work on finding uh, higher modalities in the course. Uh, are the specific frequencies what you'd expect for their metal peaks and sorry, what you would expect from flower clusters, or are these more metal poor hydraulic clusters? Yeah, so so that's a good question, and I haven't delved as deeply into that as I as I want. Um, actually, this week might have to be done, but that didn't happen. Uh, I, I asked where Smith is. I was at MSU a couple weeks ago, and I said, what do you, what do you think of this? And, you know, a lot of all of seem to be different. Um, I think that they're a bunch higher still than Smith different blobs, but I don't know how complete our senses are of higher hour modular clusters as well. So that's another factor that makes it hard to make it more high Does carbon motion data in terms of like LSC at all? Oh, great. Thank you for that answer. Yeah. So, <laughs> it'll help in huge amounts. Uh, thanks. I should have mentioned that. We're already using the proper motions in SDSS to eliminate and for contaminants, and of course, in LSST, given the very, very strong three decay magnitudes. That'll be a, a huge impact in part of the fatalities. You know, red, not just MGMs, but other giants, but as well as up to LSST. So one thing I worry about in interpreting the dwarfs as a function of radius is that you're not, you don't know what their sort of average radius is. When you attach them to one spot in the orbit, and so I, mean, I think this plot makes that point. Right? If you, by going and finding a distant star, you're not necessarily finding stars that are different. Like or, or, so have you looked at the simulations to, to see how well the current radial diffusion tracks the true sort of mean radius distribution, and whether it's so scrambled that you, you can't learn anything about that kind of radial distribution. And are you talking more specifically about the, the dwarf galaxies or the unbound structures? Well, I, and both, are, both, I think, yeah. The, the dwarfs, let's just say the dwarfs are the kind of discrete thing. Like, you're tempted, right? I mean, you see a plot like that, and one's tempted to say, oh, your things are. They have been affected entirely, but those ones are not. But in fact, they all probably come in at some point in the right time. Absolutely, no, it's a big issue, and I've only in the last couple of years realized my own um, naivete in making statements like that, and I've come to be, uh, be a lot more careful. And so I think the way that I have been approaching getting around that is first to you know, smack myself and remember most of the time is spent in the most distant part of, of the subhalo's orbit. And so not to not to complain that but when I'm seeing a snapshot on top of the assumptions that I made on top of the subject ago. But looking at things statistically, you know, one of the um, things we wanted to get out of the Elvis simulation was to look at the spatial distribution of the most stripped halos, for example. The resolution isn't high enough for us to do that. So people sometimes say, oh you know, why is why is such and such a group do we need a bigger and higher resolution simulations? But to be able to slice and dice things to, to really ask where are the things that are the most tightly stripped and how much mass have they lost. Things statistically will, will help us get those questions. But yeah, any any individual halo without you know proper motion plus radio velocity won't be able to answer that. Yeah, so I'm curious, Beth, I'm curious about these M giants you're seeing look really far out because of course in the in the galactic globulars you only start seeing M giants when you get above a certain mean of You see yeah. the same thing in the Sagittarius stream. And so but, but when I remember your diagram that you were looking at, um, what I remember sort of, uh, there was a relation between metallicity and luminosity of these dwarfs. Mm -hmm. And so, does that mean that the things that you could possibly detect far out must have come from a parent population that was actually pretty big yes. and that you're not going to be able to see the small stuff? Absolutely. This is a very biased tracer, absolutely, of, of the stellar halo, um, which I think is uh, one thing that it takes us a while to, to convince. Ah, so that's that's okay. It's still really exciting because you know if we if you let me keep my little dark matter hat on, the predictions of people like Catherine and Jake say the vast majority of the stellar halos should have been donated by a small number of relatively high stellar mass accretions. So we should expect most of the structure to be contained in that, but it won't give us a comprehensive view of all the accretions for that reason. Yeah. So can I ask a different question? Because I think. Can I ask another question, Steve? Sure. All right. So, so <laughs> it's not going to be a real one. If only. 
So you know, I mean, so again, to come back to your, you're seeing these uh, these really low luminosity dwarfs, but and so I guess a lot of them probably don't have velocity dispersions yet. And so one of the other things you, that people have been trying to do for a long time is compare the cold dark matter simulations, the mass distribution of the of the uh, of the cold dark matter clumps versus what we actually see. Can, can you say anything about that based on what people have seen in the last five years? Yeah, so actually velocity dispersions have been published for almost all of the ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. Mm -hmm. Even though the Segue 1 uh, paper uh, that I was involved with, led by Josh Simon very well, had a um, down to some limiting magnitude and near complete spectroscopic sample of Segue 1 out to two half light ray paths. Clearly B04. And the um, there are sort of different ways to slice and dice it. Luis Rivari and some others have uh, used those velocity dispersions to try to make an inference about the amount of mass contained within 300 parsecs from the center, which requires extrapolation beyond the stellar extent. And that work has suggested that there's a constant, that all of them have about 10 to the 7 solar masses within 300 parsecs, a constant mass scale. Mm -hmm. uh, other work, and I don't go all the way back, the too big to fail work has used those individual velocity dispersion measurements and work done by Joe Wolf and collaborators at UC Irvine that's shown that actually the total mass contained within the half light radius can be inferred based on the half light radius of the observed velocity dispersion in a way that's pretty independent of the shapes of the stellar orbits, which is awesome. So you put one point on each of the rotation curves mm -hmm. and then compare that against the simulated rotation curves. And if you do that for dark matter only simulations, your rotation curves are too low. Mm. But there's been other work that includes baryonic physics that suggests they're not too low. There's still this tension going back and forth. Uh, another really big conversation going on with what we can and can't learn from the measurements of individual velocities of stars within, especially the glass of the dwarf galaxies, actually, is within this period between a cusp or a core. And there's been some quite lively discussion about this. And Matt Walker um, and Mr. Gary Pink and White have a paper about that recently. And in the current generation of observations <coughs> with rate of velocities, I don't think we can do much to bring that well. I don't see us resolving the controversy very soon. Yeah, thanks. Any questions? Okay, let's thank that again.